Hello. Uh, I um, have been, for the last few years, doing research and teaching on this whole question about how can we live up to our highest potential. And, and it's, it's not a new question, of course. It's been with us from, you know, for the ages. But the approach I've taken is to integrate a combination of the latest uh, science on human nature, coming from psychology and psychotherapy and neuroscience and a few other similar disciplines, with the uh, inner lives of great leaders and great achievers and kind of studying them from the inside out to see what is it that one can do to learn from how they have perhaps exemplified some of the things that science is you know, telling us as well. What I want to do today is to um, take a couple of vignettes from, from that combination of science and great leader studies and offer it up to us um, around this question, who am I really? And before I launch into it, I want to maybe invite you, if you can, to take just you know, five seconds and think about this question as it applies to you, yourself. What are the first few images or words that come to your mind when you ask yourself this question, who am I really? And I mean, you ask it of yourself, not of, not of me. So. OK, keep a note of those as we move through this uh, conversation. Um, a, few, uh, a few years back, there was a study done at Harvard University where they took a um, number of Asian American women and they all gave them all a math, a math quiz. Now they divided this Asian American group into two groups and one of them was uh, reminded before they took the math questions that they were Asian American in origin by asking them a couple of questions so that they felt that they were, I'm Asian, I'm Asian, math question. The other half of the uh, group was uh, invited to remember that they were women before they actually took the, took the math quiz. So they were being asked a couple of questions. So I'm a woman, I'm a woman, math question. And lo and behold, you find two different results from those two different groups. The former group did much better than the latter group, all right? Just on the basis of remembering one aspect of your identity, which unfortunately, stereotypically speaking, women are considered, assumed societally in this country to be poorer in math than, than men, and Asian American on the other hand are considered to be rocket scientists and very good. Turns out that that in fact impacts your own very performance. The stereotypes of the world around you impacts your own very performance. The same kinds of studies have been done in other contexts as well. So it doesn't even have to be a real identity. So in, 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 you know, in this study, there were just people taken and they were asked to do a role play, and some were asked to do role play the boss, some were asked to role play the secretary. Before that, they were given some math questions, after they had done the role play, they were given some math questions. Turns out, lo and behold, the people who were being made to role play, the secretaries, after they had done the role play, their performance declined. Similar studies have been done on matters of race, you know, et cetera, as well. And what you find at the end of the day is that your identity, whichever way you look at yourself as a mother or as a man or as a college grad or an American or what have you, all of these are in some ways imprisoning us because of the stereotypes that we associate with them. And in any given moment, if we had to rise to our highest potential, are we being able to do that in case we're actually being in some ways imprisoned or limited by the stereotypes associated with our identity, right? And so what do you do about it if you actually want to make sure that in any given moment, you're being able to do exactly and whatever is possible for you maximally, how do you break out and unshackle yourself from the prison of your identities, right? And so I'm going to give you three, three sort of strategies that we can use going forward on how to sort of attack this kind of stereotype prison kind of base of being fused with a certain identity. The first, the first approach you could take is to kind of amend your sense of self by saying, okay, you know what, I am a man, I am American, Indian, immigrant, whatever, and I'm going to sort of like uh, make sure that I contradict and challenge any kind of limiting stereotype that the world imposes on that by looking for contrarian evidence, by looking for best practice examples, people who've actually had that identity and done something vastly beyond and different from what the stereotypes might limit that identity to be about, right? And you can therefore forge very kind of positive identities for yourself by looking for that kind of positive evidence of what may be possible, even while you are fused and identified and associated with that identity for yourself, right? So, so here's an example of, of someone who's doing that. So Churchill, you know, at some point in the Second World War was faced with this grave crisis where there was setback upon setback in, 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 the, in, in the battle um, against the Nazis, and he had to uplift the British spirit, which was at that point very broken and very, very demoralized. And the way he did that was to, in fact, educate them about their identity in a way that would uplift them, right? And so he said, you know what? It actually turns out that it is in adversity 
that British quality sign the brightest, right? So he's trying to train people to actually amend their identity in that moment, right? Um, the other approach you could take is to actually say, you know what, why do I have to be even that sort of connected and attached to my identity as based on gender or race or ethnicity or nationality or, or age or, or my income, you know, et cetera, and instead, why don't I just see myself as a human being? And as a human being, don't I have the right and the power and the potential to access the same creative force and the wisdom and the strength and the resilience that is there in any human on this planet that I could also ape or mimic or you know, get inspired by, et cetera, right? And so that would be the second sort of maybe a stepping up of the game where you try to define your identity more on the basis of just being part of this amazing potentiality that the human race possesses rather than any kind of limiting form of identity in the kind of way that we just talked about when you were in the prison. Right? And so here's an example of someone who did exactly that. If you think about where Abraham Lincoln came from, impoverished, only one year of education, Midwesterner, and he had to break through from the, that identity in order to get to a point where he was actually playing in a very respectable way on the national stage of his times. And he was not being actually met by very welcoming forces because at that time, most of the, uh, the powers that be, for example, in the Republican establishment were very cynical about this guy with a strange accent coming from hardly any education. And, and it's actually a very sweet moment right here as we talk because it was here at Cooper Union, as perhaps some of you know, where he actually broke through and he actually gave a stirring address which actually got the audience on their feet and made the establishment realize what power there was behind this person. And it catapulted him into national prominence and ultimately into the White House. And, and, and look at the way he thinks of life, right? And he thinks of his identity in the following way, that you know, that some achieve great success, anybody on the human you know, kind of plane, is proof that others can achieve it as well. It doesn't matter where you come from or who you are or what you do. The point is if somebody's done it, I can do it, right? And this is what I'm referring to as the second choice or option available to us, which is this idea that, you know, let's actually potentially, if you're interested in this, shed all other aspects of your identity except this mere and important and powerful idea that you are part of this beautiful thing called the human race. Right? So if you did that, in theory, you would have escaped from this prison cell and you'd be in a much better place. But let's kind of like step the game up one more, right? You may have escaped from the cell, but have you actually escaped from the compound of the prison itself? You might be enjoying a little bit of fresh air and sunlight now, but is there another place you want to get to, even way above and beyond, just being limited into thinking of yourself as being part of the human race? And to that end, I'm, I'm going to sort of turn to three great achievers from recent times, right? And uh, I thought it might be interesting to compare these, these three individuals because you, you have people from very contrasting fields, you know, from science to politics and people and, uh, you know, and technology and business, on the other hand. And, um, Yet, who can complain in this room that these were incredibly far-reaching individuals in terms of the kind of impact they had on the planet? Now, is there a common theme to the manner in which they defined their identity? Was a question that I wanted to ask myself, right? And so here's what I discovered about them. Um, they were not happy with purely thinking of themselves as essentially just part of the human race. Because if they did that, then as you can see from this quote from Einstein, the difference between what the most and the least learned people know is so trivial in relation to what is unknown, right? So for him, as a person hungering for, for knowledge and intellectual achievement, that difference was so small on the human plane that he had to kind of look out and transcend that human experience into wanting to create a sense of identity much larger. And so here's what he says. A human being is a part of a whole. He experiences himself as something separated from the rest. This is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to the affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must therefore be to free ourselves from this prison. You see, Gandhi, I am a part of the whole. As soon as we become one with the ocean in the shape of God, in his case, he thought of the universe or the cosmos that Einstein might have, might have thought about as God for him. There is no more rest for us, nor indeed do we need rest any longer. What about Steve Jobs? You know, it's uh, interesting because he was a very active uh, follower of Zen Buddhism. Um, apparently, the, um, uh, the uh, recent biographer, Walter Isaacson, found that the one book that he had in the iPad, the only one book, was the autobiography of a yogi, which is the, uh, the work of a leading mystic of the 20th century and one of the pioneers in introducing yoga to the West. So he clearly had the same kind of transcending, mystical kind of yearnings in him. And now, Gandhi and Einstein may have wanted to sort of be one with the cosmos, be one with the universe. I don't know if 
Steve Jobs was exactly there and thinking of it that way, but he did want to put a dent in the universe, which is what he did to exhort his, you know, his people at Apple to rise up to their highest potential. And he did associate himself with people like Einstein and Gandhi, because he kind of basically just said it, that you know, there are a few special people in the world, like Einstein and Gandhi, and I'm one of them. Um, all right. Is this kind of hubris? You know, for somebody to think that they can be much larger than even the human race, is that, you know, are, they smoking, are they smoking something that you and I should? Um, you know, it's kind of very interesting because these same three people were very grounded. If you actually think about how they talked about their own selves, it was through this idea of an ever-expanding sense of self. I'm here today, I can be something different tomorrow. And that journey is going to go on from this moment till the time I die. Right? So here's Einstein talking about how the most important thing to do is to not stop, is to not stop questioning. Right? Intellectual growth should commence at birth and cease only at death. Gandhi saying, to me, I seem to constantly be growing. His autobiography was called The Story of My Experiments with Truth. And Steve Jobs says, the Beatles kept evolving, moving, refining their art. That's what I've always tried to do, to keep moving. Otherwise, as Dylan says, if you're not busy being born, you're busy dying. Right? And um, finally, a little thought for us. The um, idea of how we transcend ourselves how does that actually come about from a practical standpoint, right? It's interesting because today there is a fair amount of science coming out on meditation. And one of the things that they have found, which I found fascinating, is that when you actually study the brain under meditation, some of the studies are showing that there is a decrease in activity in a part of the brain called the parietal lobe. And when there is a decrease in activity in that, in that part of the brain, it actually diminishes the sense of separateness that you feel between you and the rest of the, you know, whatever it is that you're experiencing at that moment. And so it is possible that, in fact, that one could, through certain practices, systematically, such as meditation, mindfulness, etc., potentially explore this realm of losing our sense of separateness and therefore feeling that greater sense of collective, universal, cosmic intelligence that somebody like a Gandhi or a Einstein or a Steve Jobs was trying to access much beyond the reach of potentially just your connection with the human race. Right? And so to conclude, you have, I would offer a menu of three choices available to you to the extent you want to sort of rise up to your highest potential from the standpoint of how you forge your identity, how you ask yourself that question, answer that question about who am I really. The first approach would be to kind of stay a little bit within conventional norms. I am somebody of a certain age, of a certain role in society, of a certain wealth level, of a certain background in history, but challenge the stereotypes associated with that and make sure that you are in a position to kind of break through at least a little bit in create a little bit of space for yourself in that prison cell. That's where you're comfortable remaining for a while. Right? Or the second option for you would be to actually go beyond that, jump beyond that prison cell and actually associate yourself with all of the human race, just like Lincoln did. Right? And the third option would be to, in fact, ask yourself if it is possible that you can see yourself as energy, as consciousness, <laughs> as something much larger than purely even just the human self in which you currently live and work and serve the planet. Thank you. <laughs>